Es ist 19 Uhr. Hello again. Uh, thank you once again for having me here and giving me the opportunity to uh, talk about mitral valve re repair. And I'd like to uh, sort of put in practice some of the stuff that we uh, discussed in the previous talk uh, with uh, with a clinical case. And uh, uh, the disclosure are the same as I had before. And the case is a young lady who came from abroad as a private patient to our clinic uh, about a month ago. She uh, was 34 years old, tall girl with three children. She was also a physician. Um, she had exertional dyspnea, Hashimoto thyroiditis, and um, parostismal atrial fibrillation. On preoperative echo, she was she knew she had a mitral regurgitation since she was a child, and she was followed by cut by by sort of follow up echoes for many many years. And the last echo showed a severe mitral regurgitation with um, uh, an ejection fraction of sixty percent. She was actually scheduled for a mitral valve repair with minimal invasive approach. The uh, how did we do the echo and how do we do the echo for mitral valve repair with minimal invasive approach? We do it just like we do it for all other procedures. Here in Leipzig, we have this uh, protocol with the sequence of views uh, that needs to be acquired as a comprehensive uh, um, examination. And for each view, it's specified what measurements have to be done and what uh, what uh, what uh, for each view what modality needs to be used in terms of um, 2d color 3d and doppler and so we follow the same protocol and uh, as we start we start from tra deep transgastric now it's short taxis i'm not only going to show you the uh, views that are relevant to our case this is a short axis view it's very important to document that there is no wall motion abnormality uh, in this patient we go to a four chamber view. You can appreciate there is a prolapse in mitral valve with by different prolapse. Both anterior and posterior are prolapsing. There is a normal uh, preserved ejection fraction, uh, although there is a high uh, grade mitral regurgitation. And you can see that there is a, we can already see a regurgitant jet there. That's sort of a complex jet. Um, uh, in the X-plane uh, view. Uh, we look at the right ventricle. The right ventricle is normal size, normal annulus, up, uh, um, um, uh, no tricuspid valve regurgitation whatsoever. So absolutely no indication to do anything to the tricuspid valve. And now we go to mitral commissural view, <clears throat> which is sort of the, the golden view for assessment of mitral regurgitation, mitral commissural view to the left, perpendicular plane cutting through uh, the middle of the valve. On the right, then we have A2 and P2. And now what we do is what, what I was showing you before. You start from the image in the middle, and then we take our, uh, uh, our plane, our sorry, secondary plane, and we tilt it right and left to scan through the entire valve. And we can appreciate where the jet are coming from. So in the middle, we see a jet, but we don't really see the origin of the jet. To the right, which is the more lateral aspect of the valve, there is a small jet that comes, yeah, that you can start to appreciate with sort of a funny looking posterior mitral valve leaflet here. And as we move medially, then there's a bigger jet. Yeah, there's a bigger jet with a small posterior mitral valve leaflet, which is sort of restricted with no real uh, anterior um, uh, valve uh, prolapse. Now we go to 3D. You can see this is a valve that where everything, but not really everything is prolapsing. We definitely have anterior leaflet prolapse that's more pronounced in the A2 area. There's P2 prolapse. A1 is also prolapsing, but you see here to the right side, so medially in the valve, there's a P3 is not prolapsing, is actually restrictive. And if you look at the 3D uh, color, the jet comes exactly from the sort of posterior media commissure of the valve. 
we uh, I did the offline analysis of this valve here, and you can see at the bottom starting with NPR starting from uh, uh, more uh, uh, medially. Uh, you you can appreciate the features of this valve with a sort of restrictive short uh, P3, a prolapse in P2, and a prolapse in uh, P1. Uh, I also did then offline a mitral valve model just to confirm my findings. Um, as I said in my other talk, we don't use this on a clinical basis in the operating room. If there's time, I do it. I show it to the surgeon at school, but we don't use this measurement for decision making. So looking at the mechanism, what is the case here? The case is the excessive leaflet motion that, that is uh, affecting the valve in an asymmetric way. We look at the circumflex to tell the surgeon how far away is from the uh, from the annulus. I did it with NPR here, and on I got always got five millimeters, so it's a, 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 a more or less five millimeter from the annulus. Does it make a big difference? I mean, certainly. Uh, when the, the surgeons hear that it's more than five millimeters, they feel sort of more relaxed in putting the stitches. But when it's like less, they may be more cautious, but I'm not sure if that really changed their practice, but it's sort of a measurement that we always give them. Assessing the risk of SAM in this case, the only significant value is the angle between the mitral valve and the aortic valve that in this case is 107. And as you see from this uh, sketch from the previous talk is less than 120. So we went on and look for the circumflex. You can see here, I started from a long axis. I turned to the left and I follow the, the left main and you can see the bifurcation and you can see the flow in the circumflex as it starts and i didn't see any more flow as the circumflex goes along the annulus cannulation is a, a key uh, uh, component of this procedure uh, we look for the wire in the uh, arterial line we look for the wire in the superior vena cava and then we advance the cannula follow it in the superior vena cava uh, what I see very often is that we see the wire in the superior vena cava and then the surgeons dilate. And at the, once they've dilated with, they hear that we use three dilator of progressive uh, um, um, size, so bigger size. So after the second or the third dilator, often the wire comes out of the superior vena cava. So this is it's, it's very important to detect that because now the wire railroads the cannula. If we advance the cannula and the wire is in the left atrial appendage or, or in the left ventricle, then we can really perforate the left atrial appendage or the left ventricle. So before the surgeon advance the cannula, make sure the wire is in the superior vena cava. And this is everywhere in the world. The surgeons have no patience. They need to wait. They cannot advance the venous cannula from the groin until we've seen the wire in the superior vena cava. So the surgery went well. The, our surgeon, that in this case was Michael Borger, he did a, he found the A to P2 prolapse with a restriction of P3. He decided to put neocords on the lateral portion of P2, and then he did secondary cordal transfer to pull down the A2 uh, segment. And then he put a physioflex ring that was 36 millimeter and the anterior uh, mitral valve leaflet, uh, we actually measured it, it was 34, I think. And we did cryoablation for uh, atrial fibrillation. So now we, we just release the cross clamp and you can see here on the left, with color flow, I can follow the circumflex and I can see flow in the circumflex the, all the way and under the, the new so the, 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 uh, the new ring that was put in. So I've demonstrated yet right away that there's flow in the circumflex. And then I, I'm, the, the heart just started to beat in the, the valve, the heart is empty. It's not pumping. I can check the aortic valve for regurgitation and there's no regurgitation. 
Now we came off pump. We did what we call uh, a trial. So the, 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 we, we just cross clamp. We haven't reperfused yet. We still need time to warm up the patient, but we come off pump and quickly look at the valve. So in four chamber, two chamber, we look at flow, uh, color and morphology. The valve is, uh, seems there's no more prolapse that can be detected and there's no flow. We look closely in the long, long axis view uh, and we can identify a very small regurgitant jet. We get a better look at the valve now with full load of the left ventricle. With X-plane, I do the same trick. So I start from the center of the valve in uh, this mitral commissural view, and then I go right and left. And uh, I can actually, uh, I identify a small jet medially and a small jet laterally. Now with 3D, we look on fast. You can see the ring to the left. And on the right, you can see these two small jets. One is a little bit bigger on the right side. That's more medial. That's where this P3 um, segment was tethered down into the ventricle. Now we uh, um, uh, uh, look at the um, uh, short axis view to confirm there is no wall motion abnormality. Despite we've already seen that there's flow in the circumflex, we need to confirm it with a normal short axis view. And remember that for these procedures, we this we have to guide. Uh, um, the uh, weaning from cardiac pulmonary bypass. The surgeons don't see the right ventricle because the chest is closed and they don't see it at all. So what we need with echo then to look at both ventricles and have a look at the right ventricle as we come off pump. So uh, this was uh, sort of uh, uh, accepted as a good result because the patient was young. She had a very complex pathology and a small regurgitant jet that was left on the medial aspect of the valve was thought to be uh, acceptable. She, uh, the mitral regurgitation also in physiological awake condition before discharge was still trace. And um, the patient was discharged home uh, seven days post-op. Uh, given our um, um, uh, policies, um, the patient stayed longer than the, she would have stayed in the hospital, probably in Toronto, but this is sort of a very normal post-operative course. And the patient sent me an email two weeks ago from home uh, to tell me that uh, how she's, she was very appreciative of, uh, of our care and she's very happy and she's doing great in recovery from her surgery. Thank you very much. And I, I hope and I think uh, uh, there's going to be a nice uh, discussion and uh, I'll be um, uh, waiting for uh, your questions and I hope uh, uh, we'll be able to answer them all. If not, then please email me and anytime, once again, I invite you to come and visit us in Leipzig. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our speakers for a fan, fantastic session. Uh, there's lots of questions that came through in the chat. So I'm going to start off here. The first one is, uh, I think it's directed at Rose. Do you prefer lung isolation or only pushing the lung away with the abdominal back? And what is the impact on post-surgical ventilation? This one that goes with this is why do you prefer, not prefer one lung ventilation in mitral repair? Why single lumen tubes? Well, um, that's a good question. Uh, somehow we had we had a few cases in Leipzig where using double lumen tube uh, finally resulted in. I, we don't know whether it really resulted, but we saw that we had uh, unilateral pulmonary edema, and uh, to the tune that some of the patients had to go on ECMO. Um, so that's the reason I was told that they completely abandoned. Uh, double lumen ventilation for mitral valve surgery. Um, so by, when I joined, they were already doing single, um, using a single lumen endotracheal tube. And uh, basically we go on pump right away. So you generally do not need, uh, I mean, you, you do not miss the thing, uh, double lumen uh, endotracheal tube because once you're on pump, the lungs are down. And when we come off, we, we close the pericardium even before we come off. So pretty much everything is done on pump um, and, then, and then we come off. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So hi. hi. Thank you for having me. That's awesome uh, to see you all. I'd like to be there in person, but uh, yeah, it's still sort of a challenge. So, so please do organize the symposium next year and invite me. I'll come. <laughs> so, the, so the so to 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 Pirose's point, you know, we did a study in Leipzig. So obviously, if you use a single lumen tube, you commit to a slightly longer bypass time. But um, in, in comparison to, to, to double lumen tube, but you obviously don't have the relative challenges of a double lumen tube. And what we actually, what's been reported by most of the other centers who use the uh, double lumen tube after mitral valve um, repair with minimal invasive approach, there's a significant high incidence of uh, re reperfusion pulmonary edema. So unilateral pulmonary edema. And we actually did a study and we quantified with the radiology, the pulmonary edema in our patients. And there was a sort of a doctor arbeit or the master thesis for one of my colleagues. And the incidence of um, um, uh, unilateral pulmonary edema after mitral valve repair or mixed cabbage or uh, meat caps in our patient's population using a double lumen tube was way, way lower than what's been reported in the literature uh, elsewhere. So for us, the choice of, uh, of a double lumen tube is uh, for simplicity. So whatever, so we try to keep things simple and, and whatever makes it faster, we, we, we go for it. And also to decrease the incidence of uh, post-operative unilateral pulmonary edema. So just to add to that, Max, that uh, we've used uh, double lumen tubes for many areas, but somehow we've I've, I've never touched wood until now. I've never experienced this problem uh, when we do a minimally invasive AVR. Yeah, um, but I mean, we, I don't know what. We... Yeah. Um, so, so something which probably we need to study that more in detail, probably. I mean, to get the answer, you should do a randomized trial. But uh, yeah. I think for us is because for us is sort of using a single lumen tube is uh, is is sort of become the standard of care. So then that that's basically what we go for. Yeah. yeah on the other hand, Piroz, On the other on the other hand, Piroz, I, I don't know when you were here in Leipzig. Maybe you were doing more of this minimally invasive so uh, right uh, anterior lateral thoracotomy uh, AVRs, but. Like right now, we don't do that many. So because there's only really one surgeon who does them, and and on the other hand, we do we do a lot of uh, mid caps and and mitral valves with uh, thoracotomy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean we do. I mean there's also here it's the it's the smallest number that we do of AVRs because as it is, AVRs are difficult to come by nowadays with TAVI. Um, exactly. But uh, the Cases which are on the borderline between TAVI and surgery, then they agree uh, to undergo surgery if we are offering minimally invasive, so right to anterior thoracotomy AVR. So. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very interesting discussion. I have another question here um, also. Can you elaborate a bit on any differences or specific challenges in P3 disease in terms of surgical technique? and other factors that influence durability of a repair. Is it simply that P3 problems are corrected, uh, correlated with basal aneurysms and medial papillary dysfunction or infarct? So the P3, I'm not, usually it is ischemic if it's only isolated P3. And uh, as Max has shown the, you know, the different, uh, factors that go against repairing the valve uh, have to be observed. And if particularly if the tenting height is greater than one centimeter and your angle is more than like almost 40, then you would avoid uh, doing a repair. If you want to do a repair in such situations, then uh, there are different techniques uh, which you have to apply at the level of the papillary muscle. Um, so you can either approximate the lateral and the medial papillary muscles with a tube graft, which is placed within the ventricle, or another technique is to pass a, a plagiated suture through the papillary muscle, the posterior papillary muscle, and bring this suture through the annulus of the 
posterior mitral valve at the level of the P2, P3. And then once you put in the ring, uh, you inflate the ventricle, you know, with your water test and then gradually tug on the suture. And you will see as you tug on the suture, uh, the, the, the P3 and the, that part of the mitral valve, the lat medial part will start coming up. You actually see it coming up. And then you decide at what point you think that you have adequate coaptation and you have adequate height of the uh, coaptation of the mitral valve. And at that point, then you tie that suture off. So that's something which you can use. So these are different. Or then, of course, you have to can put in a patch and extend the P3 and the P2, P3 area to compensate for the tethering. So these are all different techniques which you can use. We do not know really the out long-term outcomes of all these techniques. Um, but with the uh, trial comparing uh, P3, you know, I mean, the ischemic functional MR versus, um, uh, sorry, um, repair versus replacement for functional MR, it was quite, uh, humbling to see the number of recurrent uh, mitral regurgitation, 30% at uh, two years, which is a hell of a lot. And I think surgeons have changed them more towards replacement than repair for such cases. Perfect. Max, did you want to comment? I'm yeah, so, I mean, the only thing that I, I, I can, I mean, this is what, what, what we all described is unfortunately, techniques, there's, there's very few surgeons who can do. He can do it, but there's not many people around the world who can do it. Um, my, my So my point was, and the older I get, the more I try to keep things simple. So what what we have here, so what we do our practice in Leipzig is if we have, so you need, when you have a secondary matter regurgitation in the OR and you're doing surgery, when, when you're clipping, it's a different story. But if you're doing surgery, then what we do is we look at the tenting height. If the tenting height is more than one centimeter, we, we, we don't repair the valve. If the tenting height is less than one centimeter, then we, we may repair the valve. But then you need to look at the valve and look at the jet. If you have a central jet and the whole valve is equally pulled down into the ventricle, then you put a ring, it's going to be fine. What you need to know, though, is that if you look at the valve and you have an eccentric jet, yeah, then you need to think about this second situation where just putting a ring is not going to be enough. And even if you make it away in the OR, it's not going to last as a repair. So that's to me was sort of the point of, of, of presenting these two phenotypes that I think it's important that we identify and we tell the surgeon, okay, yeah, you'd be fine or mm, this is going to be something complicated. And you're measuring the tenting height specifically at each scallop, not just one tenting no, no. height in the middle. You're doing sort of no, we just no, no, we, no, we, we measure just the tenting height in four chamber view, uh, and that's it. Yeah. So um, I've got another question here regarding circumflex distance assessment. Do you measure it in diastole or in systolic? And sometimes it's difficult to differentiate between the circumflex and the sinus. Usually it's feasible in 3D, but do you have any useful tips? No, so the useful tips is um, is if you don't wanna do NPRs, so there's two cases. Either you don't wanna do NPRs just because you hate it or you don't like it or you don't have time for it, or because you don't have a good enough 3D data set, because that's also happens, that you just don't have a good enough quality data set. You, imp you have a block of the mitral valve, you import it into NPR, and you just cannot recognize the circumflex. And then if you cannot recognize this, you cannot recognize it. You can make it up, but if you don't see it, you don't see it. In that case, what, what my suggestion is, and that's what we do when when we, uh, so if, if, you, if you don't have time, you look at the mitra commissural view. In the mitra commissural view, on the right side of the valve, you, you start to see the, the left atrial appendage just right under it. 
you always, almost always see and rec can recognize the, 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 um, the circumflex. And then there, you can measure the distance from the annulus. You just have one point, but you are very close to where the highest chance of actually catching the circum circumflex circumflexes and i mean and i'm very glad i i i, I hope i had this discussion <laughs> when he was still in leipzig but i mean i think Piroz can probably comment because yeah the surgeon are always asking me no it's very important tell me how far away is the circumflex i mean is it like does it really change your technique Piroz, or or is just knowing that the circumflex is not so close it just makes you feel better i think the latter is true um but uh, no so it's very important that uh, when you take your annuloplasty sutures in the area of the circumflex that's probably from the commissure the lateral commissure going across to the p1 p2 area uh, that your needle angle is extremely important uh, so if you take the stitch this way you tend to your, your stitch tends to go into the left atrium more than the uh, annulus. And you, we, everyone should know, at least a surgeon should know that the circumflex does not run in the ventricle. It runs in the atrium. And that's how you nail it. So the important thing is when you take the stitch, it has to be this way. So you take a forehand which goes towards the ventricle uh, muscle and towards the ventricular lumen. So if you do that, I think 99.9 times out of 100, you won't nail the circumflex. And that's particularly <laughs> important uh, in minimally invasive uh, because in minimally invasively, if you if the natural angle of taking the shot in that area can easily nail the circumflex. You don't have the luxury sometimes of holding the plane of the uh, annulus in a, in, in a way that you can actually take it that way. So you have to be very careful and see that your needle is always perpendicular to the plane of the mitral annulus and goes towards the lumen more than going away from the lumen. And I, I think you can pretty much avoid it every time, however close it is. So, so the, the other thing that I wanted to tell about the circumflex is uh, I, I must admit that so this is a, a it's it's a it's a life it's, it's it's a little bit of a Leipzig thing because like I never looked at the circumflex in Toronto then I come to Leipzig and like uh, and I had to learn how to look at it so and it, and I can say my experience is um, you you need to I think it makes sense to look for it before the surgery you don't always see it so if you see it, you see it. If you don't see it, it doesn't really mean that it's, it's not there. And the same time is when you unclamp. When you unclamp, my experience now in Leipzig, and we do a lot of these procedures, and we look at it almost all the time. So definitely for mitral valve, but I also look for other procedures. You see flow in the circumflex in about 70% of the cases. When you see flow, it means that there is flow. If you don't see flow, there's two possibility. Either there is an occlusion, or that you just don't see it because of the anatomy of this patient. So the, the fact that you don't see flow doesn't always necessarily mean that there is an occlusion. Uh, one thing. Second, especially for my, for, for tracas after mitral valve repair, <clears throat> if you have a circumflex occlusion, you will also have wall motion abnormalities. So it's important to get a good short axis view before you go on pump to document that there isn't any wall motion abnormality. When you come off pump, you look at the you look at the at the, at the um, um, uh, short axis view, and, and on the other hand, look at the ECG. So the ECG, if you have an occlusion of the circumflex, is not going to be normal. And then. Finally, so it's three things, flow in the circumflex, wall motion abnormality, ECG. And if, if you have any doubt, then you have, you cannot take the patient to the intensive care unit or the recovery room. He has to go directly to the cat lab. And we've done it many times. And when we have a, a very, even a smaller, the smallest suspicion, we call the cat lab, we activate. So what is a sort of the equivalent of a STEMI? Code STEMI, they make a room available for us. We go from the OR straight to the cat lab, 
and do a cath and before you take the patient to the to, to the ICU. You cannot take a chance of a patient who has no coronary disease to actually have a clu a clu a occluded circumflex uh, in these cases. I think it does help in at least identifying patients who might be a problem. I mean, they may not be a problem. I agree with you. But at least you won't miss the ones who have the problem. And uh, you'll be able to address or at least investigate further and prevent uh, uh, a long sort of drawn ischemia or infarct, right? Absolutely. Uh, Piraz, I have another question. If you can, um, when do you decide to use a complete ring versus a band? Uh, most of the times I use a complete ring. Uh, but sometimes uh, there is a discrepancy between the size of the uh, ring you want to use and the intertrigonal distance. Now, if you feel that you need a larger ring for an anterior posterior diameter, but when you use that size and you see that the anterior posterior is fine, but it's overshooting the trigons, then you cannot use that ring because you cannot overshoot the trigons because that's going to deform the valve. In that situation, then I go to a band because I'm, I'm not restricted because the band will take the shape of the annulus itself. And uh, so that will prevent deformation of the annulus. The second thing is also when you have calcification in the posterior annulus, like a short segment of calcification where which you don't really need to excise sometimes. In that situation, again, I would take a band because stitching a band to that calcified area is okay, but if you're going to suture rigid to rigid, there's a chance of dehiscence, uh, whereas a band will not dehisce. And finally, of course, again, uh, if you're doing a... Uh, annular reduction. So if you're going to go downsize the annuloplasty and you feel that you're downsizing too much uh, just because the leaflets are very small, but the annulus is big, uh, in that situation, again, it would, preferable, it, it would be preferable to use a band. Otherwise, you will get a dehiscence. Uh, if, you, if you crunch a rigid structure, use a rigid structure to crunch the annulus too much, you are bound to get a dehiscence. So these are the uh, situations, but the most common one is the first one where there's a discrepancy between the anterior posterior diameter and the intertrigonal distance where I would use a band. And, and yeah, and one more, one more point when I feel that there is a high risk of SAM, in that situation, again, I would use the band more often than a rigid ring so that the anterior annulus is free and it's, it, 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 does, it does reduce the risk of SAM later on. Oh, that's, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. So then I've got a question here regarding seeing the guide wire in the SVC. What do you do regarding central venous access to avoid misidentification of your CVC and the guide wire? I think... Uh, Explain helps a lot, is my feeling. The you... CVC, yeah. So, so what we do, uh, I, I must say that what we do in Leipzig, we use uh, endo, uh, endovascular ECG when we place a central line for all of our cases. So you basically uh, connect a, a lead, a ECG lead to, the, to your wire for the central line and we position it. So we leave it at the depth where the, um, where the, the, the P wave is two thirds of the R wave. And we I never see my CVP line in the superior vena cava where the wire is. So I never have the problem. The problem you have sometimes when you, if the patient has a pacemaker wire, yeah. So then sometimes you have a pacemaker wire, then you don't know which wire it is. So, and um, yeah, explain helps. Um, the other, uh, and this is also, we see it for, for, for clips and for transeptal puncture. It's you, you basically need to, 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 maybe you ask the surgeon to wait or withdraw the, withdraw the wire and then have a, a good view of the superior vena cava before the wire comes in. So then you know which one it is, which one is which. 
which one is your wire and which one is your um, your um, your pacemaker wire. I must say that, yeah, as I said, with the with the central with the central um, ECG, uh, sorry, with the uh, endoluminar or endovascular ECG on the wire for the uh, central line insertion, we 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 are usually have the central line that's uh, uh, high enough actually not to see it in the bicaval view. Yeah, the other option would be that then when you place your central line. You, you put a, a TE probe before you put the central line, you can confirm the presence of the wire as it comes from the inter internal jugular vein. And then second, you can actually position your, your, your catheter. So then it's in the vein and you don't see it, that it's not uh, 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 far enough. In, it's not too, too deep into the, uh, uh, up to the junction of the superior vena cava to the right atrium. Yeah, I think the other issue is also if you have a PA line in, then it becomes also, then you also have another thing that's that's in, in that area. I also find it useful if you ask the surgeon to go back to the IVC. And if they turn the guide wire and you actually follow them, if you go very slowly, you yeah. can follow up all the way. Yeah. The yeah. I, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, uh, Piroz is very, very well educated, but in general, it's, uh, it's a matter of like educating the surgeon. And now uh, I, I must say, unfortunately, I, I need to admit we had a few complications of um, for uh, um, venous uh, um, cannulations of, for, for, um, uh, for a line for, for uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. And uh, also the surgeons who were a bit more aggressive and less patients have realized that yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's, uh, there, that, that's not really, that's not worth it. So, because if you, if you have a complication for, from a, a venous cannulation, then it's a really bad one. Yeah, no, yeah it's, it's a life-threatening one. Yeah. Mm. I have another question here. Uh, if you raise it for you, what's the philosophy of thinking between leaflet resection and cordae suture procedures for MR? How do you select the technique? Well, I usually use the respect technique. I, I, I avoid, uh, um, so let's put it this way. I use the resection technique only in um, maybe Barlow's or severe myxomatous disease where you have like extremely large amounts of leaflet. And if the prolapsing segment is like three centimeters in height, in that situation, I would use a resection plus um, so I, I won't use a formal resection, which they used used to used uh, before, like most surgeons used. But I just use a limited resection, and then I again put cordae to that uh, because the idea is to have the largest orifice possible. Um, and secondly, also as I mentioned before in my talk, that I prefer to have the posterior leaflet a bit mobile rather than just using it as a platform for the anterior leaflet to smack into. Um, so for all these reasons, you have to use the respect technique uh, because the moment you start respecting too much, it's going to become stiff. There is no way your leaflet is going to be mobile. Uh, and it does give a longer line of coaptation, which has been proven. We have papers from Leipzig which have proven that uh, with the loop technique, we have a larger orifice area, a la longer line of coaptation, which would both go in favor of a better long-term outcome. Perfect. And then I, I think I'm going to do one last question here. And Max, this one is for you. Do you think that there are any advantages to choosing between 2D, 3D, or BSA indexed mitral valve tenting area measurements? So um, uh, differences, I mean, there are studies that like, oh, so with 3D, you can measure the tenting volume, but uh, the majority of the guidelines and the majority of the studies are actually based on 2D measurements. And so, and to measure the tenting volume, you need to use a, a 3D reconstruction of the mitral valve using whatever, three, uh, uh, for the MV from TomTech or the MVN from, from Philips or the old sort of MVN, because now Philips has taken over TomTech. Or with the Siemens system, you use uh, the other um, <clears throat> Siemens uh, software. But um, uh, uh, clinically, uh, 
honestly, I don't I don't see an advantage. And and at least uh, in in our center, we rely on what's suggested in the guidelines, which is the tenting height from uh, from uh, um, <clears throat> from two D measurements. And the one comment I would add is that a lot of these three D measurements are not standardized. So depending on which software package you're using, you may get very different measurements from the same three data set especially when you get into volume measurements where they have to, to measure the volume from the some kind of annular plane and how they're developing that annular plane will make a big difference in, in terms of what you get for the volume value. Very good point. Thank you so much to Piroz and Masi for joining us. And uh, I thank, thank, really thank hope you. next year we can have you in person. Thank, thank, thank you for having us. It was amazing. It yeah, was yeah. awesome. I'm and, so happy. It was, it was really good. Thank it you. was so nice to see a surgical, you know, to thank see you. the surgical perspective with the echo. I think that was perfect. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot, to Hi, guys. And as a great uh, session. Thank, thank you. you. Nice to see you, Max. Bye bye. Nice to see bye. you too, Piroz. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.